Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We are excited to have you with us. Uh, If you are sitting closest to the center aisle, make sure to sign the fellowship pad and pass it to the people sitting next to you. And if you'll be partaking in Holy Communion this morning, please make sure to indicate that as well. And if you're a guest or visitor, leave some contact information so that we might be in touch. This morning, Pastor Lagutin is at Fountain of Life Lutheran Church in Kernersville, where he is uh, baptizing Denise Johnson's newest grandchild. Uh, So we're excited that he has that opportunity this morning. Uh, So Pastor Paul Nielsen is is joining us for today, uh, sharing with us God's Word. We're excited to have him here. Uh, The uh, last day for uh, the love offering towards missions in honor of Pastor Johnson's birthday will be next Sunday. Uh, There is more details about that in the bulletin, so if you haven't had an opportunity to look at that, make sure to, uh, to see that in your bulletin this morning. Also, at the end of the month on Saturday, April 27th, Uh, The mission team will be having their annual golf tournament. Uh, There's more details about that in the bulletin as well. Tomorrow, uh, from 2.30 to 7, there will be a blood drive here at St. John's. If you have not had the opportunity to sign up but would still like to come and donate blood, uh, make an appointment at redcross.org so that you can get a time to come and donate. And finally, if you ordered an Easter flower and haven't picked it up yet, uh, please pick it up today in the parish hall. And with those announcements, we will go ahead and begin our worship this morning as we sing our opening hymn, 465, Now All the Vault of Heaven Resounds.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to Jesus. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. be to God on high. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. May be seated. Our first reading from Acts, the fourth chapter. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, 
For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of God. God. Our second reading from 1 John, the first and second chapter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, And place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
You may be seated as we continue with singing our sermon hymn, 735, Have No Fear, Little Flock. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We're right into the Easter season, which lasts six Sundays. And historically, each of these six Sundays of Easter has been given a name, a Latin name, uh, names like Misericordia Domini Sunday. Jubilate Sunday, Cantate Sunday, Rogate Sunday, Exalde Sunday. These names just sort of roll off the tongue. And I think my personal opinion, for what it's worth, is this Sunday, this second Sunday after Easter, the name given to it is uh, the most delightful name. The name of this Sunday is Quasimodo Genity Sunday. <laughs> Quasimodo, huh? Kind of makes you think of the hunchback of Notre Dame. Quasi, like, modo means uh, mode, in the mode of or like, and genity has to do with birth and a newborn birth. So this is like in the mode of newborn baby Sunday. Welcome to it. The theme is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, which reads, Like newborn infants, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up to your salvation. So the historical connections here are really too rich to pass up. In the early church, the catechumens, those who were preparing for baptism, were baptized on Easter Eve. The newly baptized were given white robes to wear, symbolizing the righteousness of Christ that now clothes them in their baptism. And they were to wear these robes for eight days. They weren't to change out of them. This is the only clothes they wore for eight days. And then at the end of the eighth day, they would come back to where they were baptized and the bishop would take their clothes, give them their street clothes back again, and as he did so, he would recite 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation. There's a real, very real sense here that, that the follower of Christ is never, ever weaned from nursing on pure spiritual milk of the gospel. 
And so whenever the church is gathered together for worship, just like you and I are here today, right here in this place, the picture that you ought to have in your mind, I think, is that of a nest and baby birds in the nest with their heads cocked open and their mouths wide and they're chirping. They long to be fed with that pure spiritual milk of the gospel that comes through his word and the sacraments that accompany it. There's a myth that's been going around for quite some time now that says if if you're ever going to be a real Christian, well, then you're supposed to eventually grow up and stand on your own two legs and quit acting like little babies. Eventually, you got to get past all of this business of confessing your sin over and over again. You got to quit asking for forgiveness. And you got to start living your own life and stand on your own two legs for crying out loud. When actually, according to the scriptures, the truth is we're never so grown up, never so mature in our faith than when we are like newborn infants who know just how totally dependent on Jesus we are. In fact, the more you grow up in your faith, the more you crave that pure spiritual milk of his gospel. So if you want a good picture of what the church ought to look like, it's the It's the one that we get in our gospel text for today. On the evening of that first day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked for fear of the Jews. Here they are, the apostles. They're gathered together. They've seen their Lord beaten, arrested, beaten, nailed to a cross, placed in a tomb. Now, Who is going to feed them? Who's going to protect them? Who's going to make sure that they've got what they need in order to survive? He was there all in all while he was with them. Now he's gone. They're huddled in fear behind locked doors. There's a conference that takes place once every so often called the Courageous Churches Conference. And I suppose everybody goes there and they get all pumped up and boast about what brave, wonderful Christians they are. That's not the picture we're getting right here. These folks did not just come back from the Courageous Churches Conference. They've been told, they've been so bold and courageous before, Thomas, of all people, actually said, let us go with him that we may die with him. But as soon as the men with swords and spears showed up, they all ran away. And I don't know, but maybe Thomas led the pack. But now he's risen from the dead. He had told the women to tell them that he wanted to see them, which sounds like thrilling news, doesn't it? Unless you're the one who's abandoned him in his time of need. Unless you're the one who betrayed him. Unless you're the one who denied him. So, what if he really is alive? What if he really does find them? And so it is they're huddled together in their fear behind locked doors, and Jesus walks right through the door into their trembling and their fear. He comes right through the locked doors. He doesn't bother to knock. He doesn't wait for their invitation for him to come into their hearts. He just comes to his infants as a mother hen comes to her chicks as a good shepherd to the lost and frightened lambs and immediately, immediately he begins to drop his precious food into their open mouths. Peace be with you. Wow. There's no 2% milk. There's no skim milk. This is milk with all of the cream still in it. Whole milk, pure, spiritual milk. No additives, 
No laws, no rules, no regulations, no contributions, no dues mixed in that you got to pay in order to get it. This is pure grace, pure gospel. Peace be with you. His words give just what they say, just what he has promised to give. He gives them. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give unto you. Peace be with you. Let not your hearts be troubled. As if to say, open wide, my little babies. Drink deeply, my little children, for I have drank the cup of wrath to its dregs for you. And now all that I have to give you is pure spiritual milk, forgiveness, life, salvation to fill your empty hearts that you may be satisfied like you've never been satisfied in your life. Which is not to say, so don't get me wrong here, this is not to say that there is no punishment for our sin. Well, there's punishment, and you can believe it. Don't ever think that your sins go unpunished because he forgives you so freely and so plainly. It's just that, as the prophet said, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. And so when your heart condemns you, when your heart screams at you, when your heart tells you even God couldn't forgive you for this, you recall those wounds. You recall that blood that flowed from those wounds, and you let those wounds preach to you. His love is greater than your heart. After this, he said, he, after this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad. He does the same thing still to this day, friends. He comes to you, you little babies, you. And he announces his peace to you, the peace of the Lord be with you. And he puts his wounded body right into your hands. And he takes his blood and he pours it right into your mouth. And like newborn babies who have tasted the goodness of the Lord, we have peace, a peace which this world cannot give. A second time, not just once, but two times, Jesus speaks his word of peace to them, peace be with you. When, with his first word of peace, he sets them free from all of their fears And he stills their beating heart and fills it with joy. Now with a second word of peace, he sends them out to feed others with his forgiveness and his love. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So he breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. This is his little Pentecost. It comes 50 days before the big Pentecost happens. In the beginning, doesn't this just remind you of the beginning? In the beginning, God had breathed into that lifeless man that he had formed out of the dust of the ground. And the man became a living being. Now he breathes on these lifeless disciples of his and he fills them with his new life. He had breathed on the dry bones in the desert and they came together into a vast army. And so now he breathes on these dry bone disciples of his and they become the one holy Christian and apostolic church. He breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. 
It's important to see what he's doing right here. He is binding his word to their mouths. If they remain silent, so would his word. And his little babies will worry themselves to death. Rather, they are to speak his love and his forgiveness, his peace, to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness, of which there is no other kind of righteousness than this. And all who hear it, all who hear their word, that is, the apostolic word, will receive it as it was from the Lord himself and have peace. If they don't speak it, there's no peace. They speak it, and there's peace. This brings us to Thomas, one of the twelve. He wasn't there when Jesus was present that first night. When Jesus was present and fed his newborn babies. When Jesus was present and showed them his wounds. When Jesus was present and breathed on them. <laughs> Thomas missed church. See what you miss when you miss church? But the disciples do just what Jesus had breathed on them to do. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. So that's the first recorded sermon in the New Testament after the apostles are commissioned by Jesus. It's short and it's sweet really sweet. After the big Pentecost, 50 days later, sermons are going to get much longer, some of them longer than this one you're sitting through right now. But here, here it's simply a matter of an eyewitness saying what his eye has witnessed. We have seen the Lord. It's an incredible sermon, really. But Thomas, Thomas he just can't believe it. Thomas has a problem when it comes to believing the word of the apostles. In the Nicene Creed, which we'll recite in just a minute, we say that we believe in the one holy Christian and apostolic church, which means that we believe the word of the apostles, that is the New Testament. That's what the New Testament really is, the apostles' word, the apostolic word, the word that was given to them by the word made flesh, then handed down through them to you, to me, for ages upon ages. Thomas, however, he's too big and grown up for all of this. He's not ready to confess the Nicene Creed just yet. He could probably say, I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, who suffered and was buried. But he couldn't go any further than that. He couldn't bring himself to say, and on the third day rose again, because he didn't believe the apostle's word. He's a grown-up guy, this Thomas is. He is no baby. He's a Charismatic is what he is. He has to have more than just the word. He's got to touch it. He's got to feel it. He's got to see it for himself. He wants a word directly from Jesus, not the middleman, these apostles. It's got to come right from the Lord. Thomas is one of those guys who probably wants to say, the Lord spoke to me. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand in his side. Boy, he's going to great lengths. I will not believe it. And so what happens? Well, one week later, come to the second Sunday of Easter, which is today, once again, the disciples are in the room with the doors locked. They're still afraid. 
They're still very unsure. They're like newborn babies. They just don't learn things the first time through. They have to be repeated over and over again, week after week, Sunday after Sunday. Eventually, they're going to get it. Eventually, they're going to be confident in it, and they'll open the doors. And when they do, Caiaphas and all of his thugs will do to them what they had done to Jesus. But by that time, their faith will have matured. In fact, they will become so mature in their faith that they will consider death for the sake of Jesus the highest honor that could ever be bestowed on them. And they will leave this world with a confession of faith on their lips and a song in their hearts, and they'll proclaim the word of forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ to all whom they have been given to proclaim it to. But on this night, Thomas was with them. And Jesus, once again, enters the room, right through the doors, locked though they be, and he feeds his little babies once again with the same pure spiritual milk. Peace be with you. You just can't get enough of it. I want you also to be sure to notice one more thing that's not here. Sometimes it's hard to notice things that aren't there. But what's not here is any scolding, any reprimanding of Thomas. No lecture by Jesus on what a disappointment he's been. No, why weren't you in church last Sunday, Thomas? Once again, he just simply shows everyone in the room his wounds. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. This is just the way it is with us, too, with Jesus. He doesn't leave Thomas to drown in his doubts or perish in his unbelief. Just like it is with us, he comes to Thomas. And he offers his side to Thomas' hand, and he speaks his forgiving word into Thomas' ears, just like he does for us. And by the power of that word to create faith in the heart, Thomas responds, my Lord and my God. There's a lot more here than meets the eye or the ear, and we dare not miss it. What Thomas sees with his eyes and touches with his hands is the humanity of Jesus Christ. That is, he sees and touches a human being with real flesh, real bones, and real blood. But what Thomas confesses with his mouth is my Lord and my God. He sees true man. He confesses true God. In other words, Jesus gives Thomas all that he had demanded and so much more. Historians record that after the big Pentecost, 50 days later, Thomas went to India where he preached the good news about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and he died a martyr's death. The Christian church in India, which is quite vibrant, by the way, the Christian church in India to this day holds Thomas to be its patron saint. Today, the same crucified and resurrected Jesus who came to Thomas comes to his newborn infants huddled together right here. By his words and by his wounds, by his breath and by his spirit, He feeds us with pure spiritual milk of his forgiveness and his life and his peace. In all of our disbelief, in all of our doubts, he invites us to reach out our hands and to take his body and to open our mouth and drink his blood, saying, do not be disbelieving, but believe. So, happy 
quasimodo genity to you all. Amen. We stand to confess the Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, and for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You may be seated. We respond to the goodness and the grace of God with our tithes and offerings.
We sing the response hymn 763, When Peace Like a River. Stand for prayer. 
We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We'll pray by, for uh, Nancy Hildebrand, who fell on, uh, when was it, Friday, broke her hip and had surgery, and I understand the surgery went well. We'll pray to the Lord for healing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your Son is the firstborn from the dead. In him we have been reborn into a new and living hope. Nurture us with the pure milk of your word that we may grow to maturity of faith and have everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. As your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we would share that life and love with those in need. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, O Lord, that you would build up the households of your people, that your holy children begotten in baptism may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have instituted authorities to carry out your justice. Bless all who make, administer, and judge the laws of our land. Give them wisdom, integrity, and honor to serve according to your good will. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, as your son's wounds brought gladness and peace to the troubled disciples, we pray that you would give your presence and comfort to the troubled in our midst, especially to Nancy. Comfort her in her pain, grant healing in her surgery, and recovery to her normal duties. We also pray that you would comfort those who weep with the blessed joy of Easter morning. Lord, in your mercy. Father of the risen Jesus, you give us the crucified and risen body and blood of our Lord in this Holy Supper. And so we pray that you would let us taste that the Lord is good and continually grow up into salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace for the sake of your Son, you have given us the Holy Gospel and instituted the Blessed Sacrament that through them we may, be, we may have comfort and your peace and your forgiveness of all of our sins. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may heartily believe your word and through the holy sacraments establish our faith day by day until at last we obtain eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. By his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, 
and with all of the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all of the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
who received the Lord's Supper at your pew uh, indicate so, raise your hand or stand. May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in this one true faith to life everlasting, to part in peace.
We thank you, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, whom you raised from the dead, whom you give us to eat and to drink in this sacred supper, that by his body and by his blood we may be assured of your grace and your peace in our lives. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.